Someone said of that first Palm Sunday, they would lay down palms. He would lay down his life. On Sunday, they laid down palms. On Friday, he laid down his life. A lot can change in a week. Today, we begin our celebration of the most important week in history, Holy Week, Passion Week. The week of Christ's sufferings and death, and we'll cap it off next Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. When we think back and look back to that first Palm Sunday, everyone had an agenda for Jesus, didn't they? Everybody had an agenda for Jesus, and the truth is, not much has changed. We want Jesus to bless our politics, our careers, our health, our bank accounts, and especially our churches, amen? As long as he blesses them the way we want them blessed. We define blessed oftentimes in terms that have to do with power. In our American society and public success. But on that Sunday, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords brought an upside-down kind of power into our world, a power that came through the ultimate sacrifice of the cross. As Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, he was on a mission to die, to die on a criminal's cross for all those who surrounded him with accolades, for all those who poured on the accolades in the hope, again, that he would bless their agenda, which had nothing to do with the cross, which had nothing to do with their own eternal salvation. It had nothing to do with their souls whatsoever. It had everything to do with their earthly, present blessings. And yet in that sacrifice, in his humble service to us all, we see the greatest display of power the world has ever known. You see, Jesus would, in fact, truly bless all of those with an agenda for him by doing what no one else would have ever realized we needed the most. He would give salvation, atonement, forgiveness, imputed righteousness, redemption, the grace of God through his voluntary sacrifice, through Roman crucifixion, and his powerful resurrection from the dead three days later. Church, our world needs to see us who say we follow Jesus. Refusing the worldly ideas of blessing. Refusing the worldly power that comes from greed, politics, and godless religion, and instead displaying Jesus' revolutionary, upside-down kind of power through humble sacrifice and love and service to our world, including and especially, according to Jesus, our enemies. Jesus came to die for you and for me, who were his, what? His friends waiting for him to show up. His enemies. His enemies. And see, that's how we will live if, in fact, we comprehend and apply the truth. Jesus was communicating by his actions on Palm Sunday. So as we turn to Luke chapter 19, the question and the title of the message is this. Do you know this Jesus? Here's what I want you to take home from this passage. We must welcome Jesus as he is, not as we want him to be. That was the problem with the first Palm Sunday. They welcomed him as they wanted him to be. But he didn't come to satisfy their whims and desires. He came as he was, as he is, and as he always will be. And he, whether they understood it or not, is exactly what we, we being all of us in this room, we being humanity throughout time and history, throughout the world, what we need. This morning I want to show you two beautiful realities about who Jesus is that were clearly revealed on Palm Sunday. First, as we begin to read in, in, in chapter 19, verse, verses 28, we'll read down through verse 38 uh, to begin with. 
notice this. Jesus is the messianic sovereign. What was Palm Sunday all about? What was Jesus showing us about himself? What is it they, they should have understood and, 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 and that they, they kind of understood but really twisted and misunderstood? The reality that Jesus is the messianic sovereign. Jesus is the long-awaited, prophetically foretold sovereign king who came to say, make no mistake, Jesus is king. And so their words were right. Luke, 20, or Luke 19, verse 28, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he, speaking of Jesus here, drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, uh, those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Back in Matthew's account of this same, uh, this same event, Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5, it says, This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look for your king. Look, your king is coming. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, written in 520 B.C. It's amazing, even the mount of the Messiah, as he rode in Jerusalem, was foretold. What sovereignty over all the details of his arrival. Jesus sovereignly orchestrates the details. He is indeed the messianic sovereign. He is the one in control of Palm Sunday. In John chapter 12, verse 13 to 19, it says, they took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Uh, They were were shouting the words of a psalm, Psalm 118, 25 and 26. Matthew's account says they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. We just sang it. Hosanna is Hebrew for salvation has come. The son of David is our salvation. The cry of the crowd was prophesied as well. And as he came into Jerusalem, they sang the songs. They, they, they echoed the words of the prophets. Back in John's account, it says, Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 16 says, But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. Verse 18 says, That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. There were a lot of people in town for the Passover. But that text tells us the reason they all came out. They'd seen a bunch, Jesus do a bunch of signs, right? There were stories about him doing a lot of things. But he raised Lazarus from the dead. And so they thought, this must be it. He must be the one. He must be the one who's going to come and deliver us from Rome. He must be the Messiah. Luke 19, verses 37 to 40 goes on. It says, When they reached the place where the road started down the mountain of the Mount of Olives, all his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. There's a picture, I think, 
of, of, that, of that road actually going down from, from the Mount of Olives toward Jerusalem. Um, you can, you can kind of see uh, across there um, the wall, and, and, and that, that road leads down the Mount of Olives, and you cross the valley there and go into the city. Scripture goes on in, in Luke 19 to say, Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. The Pharisees are saying, do you, do you understand? They're calling you the Messiah. Rebuke them. It, it, nobody is to take the praise of God. Rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Which is another way of saying, guys, you're missing the day of your visitation. I am who they say I am, who they're singing about. They, they had it all mixed up. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what the crowds were saying was exactly true. Jesus is the Messianic sovereign. He's the king of Israel come to rescue his people and come to save the entire world. But from their greatest enemy, their own sin. Not the Romans. And the Jews, all of Jerusalem totally missed that as they welcomed their king. That first Palm Sunday, they all thought that he was coming to town to oust the Romans from Israel's capital city. They fully expected that as this parade began at the city gate, as the throng went ahead of him, that they would, they would march right to the Antonia. The, 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 uh, the, the, the fortress and, uh, there that Rome had put up. By the way, they put it up right next door to the temple. Why? To intimidate the Jews. So that there wouldn't be any, any temple revolt, any uprising around the temple, any religious fervor, driven fervor that, 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 that caused the Israelites, the Jews, to, to, to somehow rebel against Rome. And so the temple was in the shadow of Anthony's fortress, and, and, and they fully expected that's where he would go. And yet... He goes to the temple. He came to clean house, by the way. The next day, he goes to the temple, and one of his first orders of business after being declared the king, after he heard the hosannas, was to do what? Cleanse the temple. To turn it upside down. To look at God's people, not the Romans, and say, you have this thing so messed up, you can't even see who's standing in front of you. You become so blinded by greed, money, and power. You can't even see what I'm trying to do. I'm here to say more about that in a minute. They missed the fact that this king purposefully rode a donkey as a sign that he came as the Prince of Peace. Not a big strong white steed to wage war against Rome. You know, Jesus would later in the week tell Pilate, the one who represented the Roman Empire in the area, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but now my kingdom is from another place. He came in humility, and he came in peace because he didn't come to overthrow Rome he came to save the world including the Romans and the Jews from their sin oh Jesus is going to ride a white horse one day amen he'll come and he'll wage war listen to me he's not going to wage war for any earthly power in defense of any nation but in vindication of his eternal kingdom and his ways that the world's rejected and despised. On that day, Jesus will show each and every kingdom of this world for what they truly are. Every kingdom of this world for what they truly are. Empires of idolatrous state power that hate the sovereignty of Jesus. Empires of state-endorsed religion that hate the grace and mercy of Jesus for sinners. And empires of state-empowered greed that hate the eternity-shaped value system 
of Jesus. Make no mistake, no kingdom on planet earth, no nation on planet earth is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. Revelation 19, verse 11, talks about that day. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. That day will come. But for now, praise his name, but for now, Jesus comes as the messianic sovereign who brings peace with God through his sacrifice for the sins of the world. And until that day when he comes on a white horse, hear me, friends, there is still time for you to turn to him. Today is the day of salvation. But the people there that day just didn't get it. They wanted to be free from Gentile oppression, Jonathan Parnell tells us. Even if by force, even if by threats and plagues and a split sea, as they recounted so well in their history. They wanted another exodus, one that expelled the Romans. Instead, what they got by Friday morning was a bloodied has-been, a man in Roman custody, rejected by their own leaders, standing next to an infamous criminal called Barabbas, They wanted an incomparable king, but they would see a beaten blasphemer. Or so they thought. The sounds of this Sunday, this Palm Sunday, would later be betrayed by the sounds of what was really in their stony hearts. Blessed is he, would soon become crucify him. And for this reason, there's something nauseating about today. Because you see, when Jesus... Oftentimes, when Jesus doesn't bless our agenda, we're done with him. And sadly, in the church, we've told people that's what Jesus is all about. He's about he, I mean, we've just kind of souped it up, in, in, and we made up a gospel that Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life, and he wants to bless you. He wants to make everything good in your life. No, he doesn't. Stop saying that. Because when Jesus doesn't bless somebody's agenda, then they don't know where to go. They don't know what's happening. They don't know what's going on. Because he didn't bless me. (laughs) He didn't come to bless you in that sense. He came to save you and truly and eternally bless you. Oh, he'll bless you in this life. Make no mistake. Just not the way we think so often. You see, even though their words on that Palm Sunday were appropriate, they really didn't believe that he was the messianic sovereign that their hearts needed the most. They wanted Jesus to bless their earthly material agenda, and they would, in just a few days, reject him. The one they'd held as their king and refused to embrace him. In his death is their only salvation. And so here it is. What about you? What about me? Is his name just on our lips because we hope he'll make our life prosperous and easy? Or do you and I truly in our hearts know and believe that Jesus Christ is the messianic sovereign who's brought us our only hope for salvation from our sins, our only hope for peace with God through his life, death, and resurrection. You see, we must welcome Jesus as he is, not as we want him to be. Jesus is the messianic sovereign. Secondly, Jesus is the merciful Savior. We're going to pick the text up in verse 41 of Luke 19. And what I want you to see is Jesus weeps for those who reject him and longs for all 
to embrace his mercy. Luke 19, verse 41, and when he drew near, so again, the, the parade's going on. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, palm leaves being strewn all over. They, they're throwing down their clothes and palm leaves, and here he comes. Here comes the king. This is the parade that's going on, and in the midst of the parade, as he's, as he's riding along, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. By the way there, the word where it says Jesus wept, it's a strong word. It's not that in the middle of the, the, the parade where all this hollow and hypocritical accolades are being showered on him, it's not that he just kind of let a little teardrop. The, the, the Greek word here means weeping out loud, heaving with sorrows, tears of agony. This is no sophisticated shedding of a few tears. This is wailing. Because as Jesus looks at the city of Jerusalem, his heart's breaking over the rejection of their Messiah that the Jews would soon manifest. The heart of God breaks when people reject His love and mercy and grace in Jesus. In that moment when the multitude is shouting His praises, Jesus' heart is breaking over the woes of the city that He knew would slay Him. By the way, we're only told that Jesus wept in one other place in John eleven thirty five. 35. Anybody know why He wept there? We made reference to it earlier. It was the death of Lazarus, his good friend. What I want you to see about when Jesus cries, he cried both times over human sorrow. He cried over the death of his friend. He knew what would happen, but it broke his heart, the grief of Lazarus' sisters. And, and here he wept over God's judgment on the nation of Israel for the rejection of Christ that would come. In AD 70. Why does he weep and lament for the city? God has sent them the prophets and now his only begotten son. They didn't understand God's word of judgment because of their pride and unbelief. The inhabitants of Jerusalem did not recognize God's visitation in his son Jesus. Jesus' entrance was a gracious visitation. Jerusalem's lack of faith, however, leads to its destruction. Jesus' death and resurrection would bring about a new temple in the Holy Spirit. The church is the bride of Christ and the people of God. But the temple they so loved, the temple where God's presence had so long dwelt, would be torn down. Not a stone would be left on top of another. And today, all that remains as an Islamic shrine sits on the Temple Mount is the western wall, the foundation wall of the temple. Do you recognize God's visitation today? You see, Jesus knew of the brutal slaughter of tens of thousands of Jews in Jerusalem by the Romans that would occur under General Titus in A.D. 70. And his heart was full of mercy that gave way to sorrow because the nation as a whole would choose to reject him and would have to suffer God's judgment. John MacArthur said, that's the heartbreak of God right there. There's no way in the world that you can view God as being indifferent to those who perish. He is a merciful Savior. What a tender and merciful Savior, but you see, it's, it's up to each and every individual. Each person has a choice. 
the nation of Israel, the Jews of that day, theirs, theirs was not an incurable ignorance. But the cure is repentance rather than education. Today, Jewish people the world over can come to know Jesus as their Savior. They can come to trust Him as Messiah. But Jerusalem, the nation of Israel as a whole, they refuse to repent and embrace Jesus, the merciful Savior. John MacArthur again says, People who perish, perish because they don't want to trust Jesus and live. Jesus wept because of this unwillingness to believe. It grieved his heart, and it should grieve ours as well. First of all, do you trust Jesus as your Savior today? If not, I want you to hear, 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 hear the heart of Jesus. He weeps for you. He weeps that you would reject his love, his mercy, his grace, and therefore, in his holiness, have to know his judgment. If you're one of Jesus' sheep this morning, if you do know him, let me ask you a question. Let me ask myself a question. Do our hearts weep with the same mercy for those who don't yet know our merciful Savior? Do our hearts weep for people like the Anam who live in such remote places Still today, tribes who've never heard the name of Jesus. They don't have a written language. They, they, they don't have a copy of God's Word. They are unreached in, in the sense the gospel has never been to them. Does that, like, does that rattle your brain a little bit? We, we can't even get that, can we? Not fully. We've always had a Bible. Or we've always lived in a place where there were Bibles available. Where we could go to church, whether we did or not. Do our hearts break? Does your heart break for that, for that relative, for that co-worker who is just hard? You've made sure they hear the gospel. But they don't want anything to do with Jesus. Your heart should break, just like Jesus wept over Jerusalem. We're reminded of just how big Jesus' heart is with mercy as he hangs mutilated and dying on the cross only minutes from his death. And in Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them of his crucifiers, for they don't know what they're doing. Even there on the cross, mercy for those who, are, who put him there fills his heart. Jesus, Jesus is such a tender Savior, amen? But his mercy moved him to deny himself and go to the cross to meet our greatest need by paying for our sin. That means there's hope and mercy and forgiveness for me and for you. No matter what we've done, no matter how far we've strayed, there is hope, there is grace, there is forgiveness. For as Romans 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. To pay the price of all your sins. Every single one of them. Please never minimize the grace of God in Jesus Christ by, by thinking, allowing yourself to entertain the thought that Jesus couldn't possibly pay for that sin, the one that plagues you at night. Don't diminish His grace. Yes, He can, and yes, He did. We must welcome Jesus as He is, not as we want Him to be. Well, praise the Lord, this Palm Sunday today, it doesn't have to be for us like the first one was for the crowds. Their praise was hollow and hypocritical. They would, in just a few days, betray their king and supposed king and call for his torturous death. We must welcome Jesus as he is, not as we want him to be. One day, 
One day, there's going to be not a, a hollow and hypocritical Palm Sunday like that day. There's going to be a genuine Palm Sunday. Did y'all know that? There's another one coming. In Revelation 7, verse 9, it says, After this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And by the way, can I just tell you, if that's how heaven sings with a great roar, that's how you ought to sing. And what that means, East LJ, is you ain't doing very good. And so when we sing, you ought to be a lot louder. It says a great roar. My grandpa, bless his heart, he was Methodist. And uh, that's really not what I was saying, bless his heart about, sorry. <laughs> Got ahead of myself. He was Methodist, and he would take me to this great big, they had a pipe organ, Sam Jones United Memorial Methodist Church in Carville, Georgia. He would take me there. I loved to go because my girlfriend went to church there. I was in the fourth grade at the time. And here I am, I'm, I'm like whatever fourth grade age is. Anybody help me? Ten, is that right? Close? I don't even know, it doesn't matter. And we're singing, and my grandpa could not sing. But whatever you would call what he did, it was loud. And I was sitting there hoping my girlfriend couldn't hear my grandpa singing because it was terrible. And he looks down at me and he said, Son, the Lord said make a joyful noise. Now you sing. And so I've been singing loud ever since. Probably about like grandpa. Man, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there on that day? When a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, stands before the throne and before the Lamb and praises Him with a roar. A shout so loud that it's just like a roar. Are you right now surrendered to Jesus Christ, the Messianic Sovereign and Merciful Savior? Don't miss the day of his visitation. He's here today. He's revealed himself through his written word and through it, through it preached to you. It's in your ears. You hear who he is. You hear why he came. You've heard the true gospel. This is what he's really about. Are you surrendered to him today? And then church, if we've embraced Jesus as he is, then we'll spend our lives to spread his mercy to our world. We'll weep for those who reject him and plead with them, even as we deny ourselves and make sacrifices to tell them of our merciful Savior who loved them to death, that they might be forgiven and live forever with him. Do you know this, Jesus? Jesus.